Okay, well, since we haven't been at this for a while, I'm going to briefly review what we've come up to and then where we're going. I guess the, the basic idea Well, maybe I'll start with something new instead. I guess we probably reviewed enough. I'm going to read you something from Tolstoy, which you probably read. Well, if you read it, you read it. One of the things we're going to discuss today is uh, the manner in which anomalous information presents itself, the different manners in which anomalous information can present itself, um, and how that how anomalous information as a category is represented. Basically, now we know already that anomalous information tends to adopt symbolism associated with the feminine, feminine and with chaos, right? Because it's anomalous information, uh, in, which is information you don't expect, of course, that produces emotional chaos because it disrupts your versions of the emotional significance of the present and of the future and of conceivably how to get from one to the other. Now, our whole discussion so far has been based on the idea that you can look at the world from two different perspectives. And when you're thinking about the constituent elements of things, you can take the straight materialistic perspective, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do, and talk about how things are constructed scientifically, as if they're independent objects. And we've got a long ways doing that. But there's another way that you can look at the world, and that's as a place that exists as experience and as a place that exists as a stage for action, basically. And it, it is the case, I think it's, it's well known and not frequently disputed, that the world as a place to act is not derivable as from the world as it exists, which is to say that you can accumulate all the facts you want about a given situation or a thing, and that doesn't tell you how, you how you should conduct your behavior in that situation or around that thing. And the reason for that, basically, is because you have to choose. You have to make decisions about what constitutes the optimal solution to your particular emotional problems. And I, I said before, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately, I think one of the reasons that average people or the non-academic community has contempt for the academic community is because we have been laboring under the presumption that knowing facts is, is what intelligence is for. And that's not right. Intelligence is to tell you how to regulate your emotions. That's what it's for. And you do that by figuring out how to behave. If you've explored something thoroughly from this perspective, it means that you know how to act when you're there. It doesn't mean you know everything about the situation from the factual perspective, and that's obvious because you'll never find yourself in a situation where you know everything from the factual perspective. And that brings up another interesting point, which is how is it that you can stop asking questions since you're always surrounded by an infinite number of mysteries? And the answer to that is, as far as I can tell, that you stop asking questions about a situation when what you know is good enough to get you where you want to be in that situation. And that constitutes grounds for presuming that your exploratory behavior in that situation has gone far enough. So if I want something from you, despite the fact that I don't know everything about you or even anywhere near anything, everything about you, I know you sufficiently when my interactions with you produce the results that, that, I, that I desire. And so that gives us some insight into how it is that your knowledge can both be limited but sufficient. And that's a useful, that's a useful piece of information to have. You're in explored territory when what you do produces what you want. 
and that from the mythological perspective, explored territory is one of the constituent elements of the universe. Right? That's the gnome. That's the patriarchal system. You're in unexplored territory whenever something you do produces a consequence you don't expect. And that's, that's an interesting notion because we tend to think of territory as the place that you're at, but this is in a sense a way of making a leap up into the idea of a spiritual territory because psychologically speaking, you can be in the... Uh, psychologically speaking, despite the fact that you're in the same place, you can be in two different places if, sorry, let me get this straight. Even, though, even if I don't shift position, I can be in two different places. If I'm talking to you and what I want to happen happens, that's one place. And if I'm talking to you and something I don't expect happens, that's another place. Even though I haven't moved, the emotional significance of those two places is entirely different. So. And those are psychological places. And as far as myth mythology is concerned, it's psychological places that are real. And that's at least with regards to their significance for behavior, which is what myth is concerned with. We know myth is concerned with morality. That's, that's, not, that's not news. All right. So there's the place that you're familiar with. And that's the place that you've explored sufficiently so that what you want to happen is happening. And there's a place that you're unfamiliar with. And that's the place that emerges when you make a mistake. And then there's the process that turns one into the other. Which is to say that if you make a mistake and you continue to explore, you might be able to modify your behavior so that the consequences of your mistake vanish. Which basically means that you can figure out how you should have behaved in that circumstance and that you rectify your behavior in the future or that you can smooth things over so that the consequences of your mistake go away now. So that's the capacity to turn chaos into order. And it's also the case that you can turn order into chaos. By continuing to explore in territory that other people have already defined as sufficiently explored. And that means that the process of creative exploration can bring order and it can also bring chaos. These are forms of anomaly here. They're written down in the, in the manuscript. The revolutionary hero as a bringer of anomaly is someone who continues to explore when everyone else says we're getting where we want to be at the present time, which, which is to say they're saying you should leave well enough alone. All right. <coughs> One of the things that we've been trying to do, well, we looked at mythological re representations of the unknown, and they tend to take two forms. Basically, they tend to manifest themselves in feminine shape, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but the basic reason is because it's the unknown that everything comes from. When you explore something unknown, you generate new information, so it's reasonable to conceive of the unknown as a matrix. And the idea of the matrix is contaminated, cognitively speaking, with, with notions of uh, creation and notions of the source. And it's reasonable to think of the unknown as the source of all things. It's reasonable as a consequence to think of it as in the same category as feminine things. And the unknown takes, the unknown as a feminine thing takes on two sets of characteristics. And one is the creative characteristics and the other is the destructive characteristics because the unknown can disrupt things and destroy them and it but it also serves as the ground for everything so it has a, an affectively ambivalent status that's permanent so that's a constituent element of experience the unknown always has this structure it frightens you and it makes you hopeful and it does both of those simultaneously and that puts you into a state of intrapsychic conflict so which, which has really nothing to do with your, your psychological state as an individual. It basically means that no matter who you are, if you encounter something unknown, those two sets of emotions are going to be generated. And then the other thing we tried to do was to think about how the known itself is structured. And that brought us to this idea, which, which in its sort of elaborated form, which is that 
if you know where you're at and what you're doing, it means that you have a stable view of who you are and also where you're going and, and also how to get there. And that's all one thing, that's one story. And if you're cooperating with someone and you're doing something, then your story is shared, you've hammered out your differences and you've defined a territory that's bounded basically where almost nothing unpredictable can happen. One of the things we tried to do was to figure out how, well, the, the simple model was that you have an, a theory about where you want to go and a theory about where you are, and you have a, a series of plans to, to get from one to the other. But we also have discussed the fact that the plans themselves are actually theories of the same sort. So that diagram presents what are basically nested stories. Like your small ambitions are nested in your bigger ambitions. You take a you, t you you come to a class to graduate from the class. You graduate from the class in order to get your degree. You get your degree in order to pursue your career. Your career is part of your duties as a citizen, and so on and so forth. So stories tend to become nested in one another, and this nesting also has the form of a dominance hierarchy, right? Because if we're engaged in a dominance dispute. What that basically means is that we're arguing about whose story is going to occupy a superordinate position. That's one way of looking at it. We might also both be arguing in order to construct a third story that we can both agree to, but that doesn't happen very often. If it's sort of a brute force dominant struggle, then it's just whoever has the most uh, effective argument and tools at hand, which could also involve physical force, wins. Right? My story takes precedence, or at least in this situation. So that's a dominance hierarchy. And the known, which is explored territory, it's also equivalent to culture, is constructed of the internet of sequences of internested stories that have been arranged in terms of their relative importance over spans of thousands and thousands of years. And one of the things we've been trying to do is to figure out, well, if you're if you're in the same culture as someone else, it means that you share at least a certain set of stories with that person. And what we've been trying to figure out is what those stories consist of, and, and also what might be the, the most superordinate story, right? The story that governs all other stories, which you might think of as the king of all stories. And that's part of the reason why I told you about the Mesopotamian creation myth. Right? In the Mesopotamian creation myth, Marduk voluntarily confronts Tiamat who's the agent of chaos. He cuts her into pieces, and he makes the world. And for the Mesopotamians, that was the role of the king. The king, as long as the king acted out Marduk, then the culture progressed properly. And so the Mesopotamians said, except they didn't say it, they acted it out. They acted out the idea that the most superordinate story should be respect for the process that generates all stories. Right. And that's, well, that's sort of a paradox, I guess. We represented that. This way. Say. You have a story when you're a child, and it's basically an authoritarian story, which is that someone else is, is God, usually your parents, at least if you're lucky. But that doesn't work forever because it soon becomes evident, not because your parents fail, but because you change that your parents aren't God and that there's problems that they can't solve, which is to say that there are unknown or anomalous phenomena that emerge that your parents can't attribute determinate meaning to. And usually what that means is that you have to adopt the, what it means is that you come to adopt the beliefs of a group. And initiation rituals, which usually involve, a, well, Iliad says all initiation rituals involve a regression to the beginnings. In fact, Iliad was convinced that all archaic peoples, whenever they attempted to create something anew, whatever it was, they always construed the creation of something new in terms of reference to the cosmogonic myth, which is, you know the myth, the myth is chaos gives birth to the original set of parents who in turn give birth to a divine son, who in turn separates them, right? That's the cosmogonic myth. And for the archaic people, every act of creation replays the cosmogonic myth. 
we know a little bit about why that is now, too, because it does seem that whenever you rearrange any aspects of your story at any level of analysis, you do go through a routine like that. It says your presumptions are wrong, which basically means that the meaning that you attribute to things is not stable, and you have to readjust those. And during that period of readjustment, your emotions are dysregulated. And the mythological way of referring to that is that, in a sense, at least in part, you return to the state preceding the division of order and chaos. Every act of creation is, has the mythological structure of the construction of the world. Anyways, a group tells you how to be, and it provides a good answer when you're an adolescent to the problems that, pose, that are posed to you as a consequence of your development that your parents cannot answer. But the problem is, is that a group provides a determinate answer, which is a list of rules, essentially, that says that good is such and such, and that bad or evil is such and such, and, which is perfectly fine under most conditions, but it does, upon occasion, occur that the fact of the group presents a problem, or the group's notion of how to adapt to the environment is wrong. That happens, for example, when if you have a, a group belief that's very strong, and I have one that's very strong, we engage in a dispute that results in our mutual demise. And for me, that indicates that there's a problem. I mean, it's a strange situation, because it is the case that under many conditions, people will risk their own extinction in order to maintain the structure of their groups. So there, you, you can take the position that the best thing to do is to die for the fatherland, which basically means that even a problem as extreme as the fact that your group identification might kill you isn't sufficient problem to indicate that there's something wrong with its structure. That's an extreme authoritarian position. But we're going to take the position that the fact that groups in opposition cause conflict is an indication that there's something wrong with the idea that the group is the final solution to all of your problems. It's a choice. If you, we know that you have to have group identification in order to make sense of your emotional experience because you need a way of limiting the meaning that things offer to you to some comprehensible and acceptable domain. But we also know that group identification has its own set of problems. So what we need is a solution that has all of the advantages of group identification without any of the disadvantages. And the positive answer, the positive alternative is portrayed in this chart as the capacity not to identify with the group, but to move to a state where Giving due respect to the group, you identify with the process that brings it to, into being, which makes you the agent that constructs it, no, which makes you determine that the process that constructs the group is actually more important than the group itself. And that gives you, that gives you a way to be, which basically means a structure that regulates your emotions, and also something that attributes determinate meaning to all of your to all of the experiences that you encounter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's a question. Um, the first in adolescence you said that's identification with the parents. And then in the second one identification with the group. Identification with the zero. Okay. In the, the first case, it's not identification with the parents. It's, re it's reliance on their dependence word. On dependence, yeah. yeah. And then dependence on the group. Yeah, and that would be identification with the parents, actually, the second stage, because that's basically, if you think of the group as sort of an abstracted parent, which is a perfectly reasonable way of looking. In fact, usually what your parents are when you're a child is not so much your parents as those representatives of the group that you have to come into contact with. Right. That's part of the reason I think why it's often difficult. This, this comes up frequently in, with people who have the, the dependent type of neurotic personality. So they can't dissociate themselves from their parents because they don't know that their parents know that what they see in their parents is the group and not the parents. This is especially true, I think, with the father. 
I mean, your father is more than an individual in a sense. He's also the intermediary that you first encountered who embodies all of culture. And as a consequence, he's a, fi a figure in a sense that's much more powerful than he is when construed simply as an individual. Question. Yes. Where is the identification or dependence on the self? If the, the, the goal of the journey is identification with the hero, because like, there's a particular, like you said, neuro, neurotic form Depen yeah. dependence on the parent, which is also like dependence on the form of culture. Where is it right. a dependence on the, on the self? Here. Oh. Well, what do you mean by the self? I think in terms of a different form of neurotic. Oh, you mean selfishness? Yeah. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. We're being being filled by the self, like self-dependence, self, self. Oh yes. Well, I, I was reading something about that just before I came down. There's a newspaper article about one of Roy Baumeister's new papers, and Baumeister has been making the claim recently that aggressive behavior is associated with inflated self-esteem. Now he puts that, it's an interesting paper because he puts that in the following context. You know in elementary schools and junior high schools across the United States, the self-esteem movement has been making great inroads. And the self-esteem movement basically <coughs> proposes that as long as you feel good about yourself, nothing else matters. And the problem with that is that it uses indiscriminate positive reinforcement, which I regard actually as a form of abuse. So it makes the world unpredictable. If I reward you, regardless of what you do, what I'm telling you essentially is that what you do has zero meaning. Right? Because it's not informative. You change your behavior, nothing happens. That means, you ha that means you're powerless, basically. Anyways. Yeah, I just saw an article in the Globe about that. They were saying uh, some studies done where they had, they had uh, asked uh, a group of Japanese students and a group of American students who had both taken Right, right. Math. It's the same article. Yeah, they had both taken math tests how yeah. they felt about themselves yes. and the Japanese had scored a, a considerable amount higher and they, when they sort of didn't feel so good about themselves as the American kids had done poorly and felt great. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that, that brings a, up another point though. Yeah. If the whole point of behavior is to regulate your emotion and you're able to regulate your emotion that way, why bother with, with well, because it only, it only, no, that's a good, that's a perfectly good question. That, that ties into some other social psychological research on self-deception, actually. Feeling good about yourself, only, despite the actual environment, only works for a very short period of time. That's the problem. It's a good short-term solution. You know, if you can, if you fail an exam, you can say, well, that's okay. I'm still all right. Well, that's, that's fine, except that failing the exam might actually mean that you don't get through graduate school, for example. And like sooner or later, these let's say these these uh, these things that you're not going to pay attention to, or that you've decided not to pay attention to, are going to accumulate and, and eat you up. So that's the problem. I mean, we know neurotic solutions work. That's why people use them, right? We know that's true. It's like the the problem is they don't work in the long term. That's why. Let me read you some. Uh, I still haven't answered your question. I just sort of zipped around a little bit. Um, it's a complicated question, and that's why I'm sort of hitting it from different perspectives. And I know you've addressed this issue before. The thing that you're talking about has more to do with presuming that you're right, despite all evidence to the contrary. And that's, that's, that's worship of the self in the sense that that you mean it. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about that anymore because the, starting next week, everything that we discuss for the rest of the course is directly related to that. Look, we've given this diagram here. We've talked a little bit about the structure of chaos, the chaos that exists prior to the division of things into order and chaos. So that's represented by the dragon. Okay. We've talked about the unknown in its positive aspect and in its negative aspect. We've talked about the known in its beneficial and secure aspect, and as tyranny. But we've only talked about the individual in terms of the positive aspect, which is the process that separates the sky and the earth, or that distinguishes between order and chaos. We've never talked about the negative aspect of the individual.
And I think that's probably why this question keeps popping up in your mind, in a sense, is we only have five-sixths of the story, and there's a big hole where the other sixth should be. And that's what we're going to start to talk about next week. So part of the, part of the question is, like, why is it, why is it that, why would you ever put yourself in a situation where you tell yourself a story that you know not to be true? It's a very peculiar idea, because animals don't do that. I mean, chimpanzees will use a little bit of deception on other chimpanzees. Uh, but that's about as developed as deception seems to be in the animal kingdom. I don't think there's any evidence whatsoever that animals actually ever fool themselves. But we do that all the time. Now, that's part of the path that's defined in mythology as a very dangerous one. Part of what we want to figure out is why would people be motivated to do that? It's like part of part of the problem is, is that you know you're cruising along your track and a piece of information emerges and you think that piece of information is so terrible that I can't deal with it. So it's just shunted aside. And you're in a box, which is your story, that you know to be insufficient. But you're also not sufficiently convinced of your own adaptive potential to risk stepping outside of the box. So then you're in a little trap that gets smaller and smaller all the time. There's a story in this manuscript about a North African tribe called the Marabouts. And uh, they do this interesting little ritual with the scorpion. I don't know if this is a true story or not. It might just be a myth. It doesn't matter. They take a scorpion and they put it in the sand and they draw a big circle around it. And the scorpion, who's sort of upset about being surrounded by these larger creatures, attempts to escape. And as soon as it comes up to the, the groove in the sand, it just runs around the circle. It won't cross the border. So then the marabout takes the circle and divides it in half. And the scorpion zips around inside the half circle. And then the marabout divides the circle into quarters. And the scorpion is getting more and more frantic all the time, confined to the smaller and smaller space. Finally, they bisect the area so drastically that the scorpion can't move, and then it stings itself to death. And that's a good story of what happens to you if you constantly believe that you're in a position that's actually better than the one that you're in. I do. Th I'm telling you that story again because I do think it's related directly to the question that you're at, that you're asking. Where the salt is stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, have you started reading Paradise Lost? Well, that's a story about what happens when you think that what you know is all that needs to be known. That's right. That's that's the adoption of a position of false omniscience, mm -hmm. and the consequences of that are that you end up in a situation that's very much analogous to that of the scorpion. So, okay. Okay. I don't know whether to, I don't really know whether to close close this discussion and start the new section or to finish because we haven't talked about these different forms of anomalous information yet. We should just go to the next section. Let's take a look at this. I guess we'll do. I'll do what I have planned to do. Okay. One of the things that we discussed just before the class broke was how it was that stories came to be constructed. And part of the reason that we were interested in that is because it's obvious that some of the stories that you tell yourself you don't actually know. For example, if you would have read the Mesopotamian creation myth three years ago, my guess is that it would have struck you as a bizarre tale, but not as something that had any meaning that was relevant to the present time. It's not that easy to figure out what it might mean for for a god to be elected as the highest of all the gods and then go out and cut up a dragon from the purely uh, literal perspective. 
that doesn't seem to be a story that has very much meaning. Uh, but it's a very old story, and if you track its development historically, you can see how the ideas that were embedded in that story conditioned all sorts of behaviors that we actually engage in. And as far as I, this is, of course, open to, to any amount of historical interpretation, but it seems to me that you can make a reasonable case that the Mesopotamian idea that there's something divine about the capacity to conquer the unknown and to construct things as a consequence developed into the Egyptian idea that the optimal pharaoh was someone who simultaneously embodied the state and updated the state. And it's not much of a leap from that to the Judeo-Christian pers perspective, which says that there's something eternal, immortal, and divine about each person. Now, if you accept that line of logic, then you have to also accept the idea that you can act out stories by yourself and with others in huge groups without understanding what the stories mean. And the next step of logic after that is that if you don't understand what the stories mean, what form do they take? How is it that they're coded? And how is it that they exist? They're not part of the objective world, so to speak. They're not something that you can talk about unless you tell stories. They're not something you know. At least you don't know them well enough to say what they mean, but nonetheless, they condition all of your behavior. So the question then is, well, what form do they take? That's what this diagram was attempting to, to illustrate. At every level of analysis, the story you tell yourself is informed by a variety of sources of, of information ranging from the purely behavioral to the entirely abstract, which is to say, how, your question is, how is it that I should act? And the answer is, well, you should act, and here's a list of rules that are explicit, or you should act like person A acts, which means that you should imitate them, which is what you'll do naturally anyways, or I'll act out some hypothetical sequences and you can, you can copy them, and that would be the role of drama, or I can tell you a story, and you can absorb whatever information you can from that, use that to govern your behavior. So the stories you tell yourself are constructed as a consequence of your encounter with information at all sorts of different levels of analysis. And different stories are coded at different levels of analysis, and it strikes me that the farther out you go, As I said before, the farther out you go, which is the more superordinate the story is, the less explicit the story becomes, which is to say it's more coded in procedural knowledge, and also the older it gets, which is, I, I do think it's reasonable to think that as you move up the hierarchy, you move back in time. That's a good way of looking at it. So the, the stories that you act out at the most superordinate level of analysis are unconscious. And what does that mean? It means that everyone just acts them out and can hardly even describe them. Or we have some stories about them, and that's the best we've been able to do. And no one actually says, well, this is what that story means. We just act as if the story is true. And we act as if it's true because, well, that's a, that's a tough question. At least because it works. And the funny thing is, is the, the, the same story keeps emerging in culture after culture, so it kind of leads you to the conclusion that there is actually one story that works only. Well, who knows if that's true? So anyways, we, we try to tie that, this idea to the idea that there are different memory systems. Does that make sense? I mean, do, you under, do, you, do you understand how it is that you can figure out how to behave without being able to come up with a description of how it is that you behave? Yeah. That, that seems reasonably clear to everyone. I mean, we're conditioning each other's behavior all the time. That's the basic idea, That's right? Whenever we're engaged in any sort of interaction, we're modifying our own behavior and the behavior of others. And we do that to everyone we encounter, and everyone does it, and everyone does it over a huge expanse of time. And as a consequence, a pattern emerges that we more or less all accept. And when we don't accept it, there's a big fight. And someone wins and someone loses. And whoever wins, their behavior continues in the future. So we, we gather patterns of behavior over time and integrate them into a statement that's more or less coherent. And what we're trying to do is to figure out what's the essence of that coherent and long-lasting statement. So. It's, <clears throat> I, I agree with what you're saying that um, 
people can't come up with a conscious representation of, of how they act, you know, for, for a lot of things. But I think they do know um, of ways of, of acquiring, even if they can't consciously say what somebody else is doing, and they, if they want to exhibit those behaviors themselves, they know that they should imitate right. um, other people. Absolutely, and I, that seems to me, that's a very peculiar thing, and it's the thing that I think provides the strongest evidence for the existence of something like Jung's archetype. Because one of the things you could say is, well, why do you admire someone? Well, you might say it's because they can get something that you want. Well, and that's a pretty mechanistic explanation. And you don't really have to posit any underlying predisposition. It's just that you have to want something, and you have to be able to observe that someone else gets it. And maybe that's sufficient. But it strikes me that the capacity to admire someone is more deeply rooted than that, and it's not purely driven by observations that someone else gets what you want more effectively. And it seems to me that that's actually one of the things that bootstraps children's development. Like I can remember when I was very young, well not all that young, I guess in grade one, how much I admired the boy across the street who was in grade three. And for me, that was a huge gap at that time. And he was someone I wanted to be like. And I don't really think it was Perhaps it was at least in part because he could do things I couldn't. But it seemed to be something that was more global than that. Like it, wasn't, it wasn't built up, I think, from repeated observations that uh, you know, he could ride a bike faster than me. Or, but you know, maybe, that's, maybe, maybe that was Do you think it's just that same sort of idea, but embodied in a more general way? Like he knows what to do. I mean, he's just yeah. comfortable in doing that, well, things. True <laughs> enough, true enough. But like, I mean, you just, you, that you sense that his story is better than yours. Okay, so. fine, fair enough. But it is also the case that children start to imitate at such an early age that it's hard to believe that the reason they're doing it is because they've drawn an inference. You know what I mean? Because, like, kids, kids, there is some evidence that newborns can imitate. If they imitate facial gestures. It's debatable. It doesn't take very long after that to find... It isn't much after birth that children do imitate. And you can say that's because they're driven by these sorts of mechanistic inferences, but it looks to me like it's something more, more profound. I, I, I want to just tell you one other piece of evidence that's something equivalent to this. People who have Tourette's syndrome, that's disinhibition of, it's disinhibition of procedural memory habits is what it looks like. Uh, if you feed them little bits of antipsychotic medication, it will often dampen out their motor tics. But they're called tics, and people think of a tic as something like that. You know, but tics can be very complex. Like people who have Tourette syndrome can do very complex things. I saw a film once of a sculptor who had Tourette's, and he was a realist sculptor, and he was very, very good at it. But he he had Tourette's unbelievably badly, and his motor behavior was completely dysregulated. And basically, he'd sit down, and, and a motor tick would get him. And so he'd get up, and he'd walk over. And then he could sort of control it, so he'd adjust the stereo. And that was it. Like, it, it was all involuntary behavior until he got near the stereo. And then he could control it enough to, to just add his twist to the behavior. And then he'd come back and sit down. And he was like bouncing up and down like this all the time. And that's how he'd do his sculptures. Like, he'd be sitting, and he'd have a tick, and he'd get up, and he'd move. And then his sculpture would be over there, and he'd pick up his knife and make a little twist. <laughs> Down. And Tourette's, the reason I'm telling you this story is because people with Tourette's syndrome are very, very, very imitative. Like there's a story, actually, where I used to live in northern Alberta, a little bit farther north, there's a group of Hutterites. I think they were Hutterites. They might have been Mennonites. Anyways, the problem with these isolated religious populations is they tend to get somewhat inbred. And one of the consequences of this in this northern colony was that very high rates of Tourette's syndrome. And one of the one of the stories I remember about that was all these, I think they were Mennonites sitting in a church together. A bird flew into the church and they all flapped, flapped. A large proportion of the population of the church would involuntarily flap their hands because they were imitating the bird. And Tourette's, one of the things that Tourette's also does to people is give them an uncanny ability to mimic and caricature other people by copying their motor habits. And anyways. The reason I'm telling you this is because it looks like the capacity to mimic is something that's underneath the capacity to form abstract representations. So it's more it's more primordial. Right. Oh, so this is this is just to say that it's like a, a biological it's hardwiring. That's right. That's what I'm saying. Now that, that's why I was talking okay. about the, the, the why I think there's some support for a union notion of an archetype with regards to imitation. 
is you can come up with a good explanation for why people imitate by saying, I see that what you do is more efficient than what I do. And, and I think that does drive imitation to some degree, but there's also another level of imitation that's, that's more how do you primordial than that. How do you select what to imitate? Then? What's, the, what's the selection process? Why the boy that you focus on? Well, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, you, I, I guess I don't know what, what level of analysis you're asking that question. Do you mean in general? Why do people do it? Well, in, in, you're, the way you're describing imitation without the inferential part, I mean, as not as a result of right. Difference. Then what's the process of? Selection? That's a good. Now that's a, that's a very good question. I guess I would. I don't know the answer to that. I guess I would. I would surmise. Did I ever show you that picture, that Eastern picture of the recurrent bodhisattva? Sava Satva? You remember that? Yeah, the image of basically the image of the savior that's constantly recurring throughout time. I think that I think that the notion that we have an in, innate sense of what's appropriate globally is true. So I would say that when but it's 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 like with, with grey lag geese, I guess. It's, a grey lag goose will attach itself to something. So it, it has the capacity to develop an exceptional attachment. But it also has to see something in its environment for that capacity to manifest itself, right? That's imprinting. And I suspect that's what our general proclivity is like. It's like, say, it's analogous to the notion of the possibility for developing conditioned fears more easily to some phenomena than others. It's like, if I want to make you afraid of something, say I take you into the lab, and I show you some pictures of an electric outlet, and I give you an electric shock every time you see one. Or I show you a picture of a snake, and I give you an electric shock every time you see it. You'll develop condition fear to the picture of the snake faster than to the picture of the electric outlet. So it's not exactly as if you're innately afraid of the snake. It's just that in the presence of a snake, you're, it's easier for you to develop fear. And my guess is that we kind of have the same, a similar sort of mechanism operating with regards to heroic behavior. It's, it's, we have the capacity to, to know it when we see it. And it's at the level of a global pattern recognition. So that, that's a speculation. Isn't everything that we know how to do imitation? Like a child learns how to speak by you know, imitating, repeating after. Well, that's, a good, that's an, another good example of the same sort of things. A child does not exactly learn to speak by imitating. A child has to have the capacity to speak. It's like if you take a chimpanzee, no matter what you do to the chimpanzee, it's not going to learn to be a concert pianist. It's because a chimpanzee doesn't have the capacity to imitate that sort of behavior. It's also the case that no matter what you do to a chimpanzee, it's not going to learn to talk. Because the chimpanzee doesn't have the capacity to imitate speech. Now, some people say that's because of the, the structure of its, the morphology of its speech unit. But they're not very good at manipulating symbols either. You know, they can get a little ways, but not very far. A child will pick up language very, very rapidly. What is it What's that? Is it never here? Well, th then no. And there also seems to be a certain critical period. Like if a child isn't exposed to language within a certain span of time, say at least by the age of 13, then there's not going to be any language development. So it's not, and it's not just imitation, you see. Because the, the grammatical, children make standard types of grammatical errors that they didn't hear their parents make. So it isn't straight imitation. That's what Skinner thought, by the way. It's not true. Because children don't hear. But they, the, the grammatical errors that children make, their parents don't make. So they... They learn rules. Yeah. No, they act as if they learn rules. Yes. Right, but that's different, right? It's different. Well, first, yeah. But language, see, language is not imitation. Like, I have a problem with that because it's very much innate and hardwired. Like, right. We need capacity as human beings where children say words or they have syntax ability that they've never heard from them. Right. They, you know, they can put a noun and a verb together and create sentences that spontaneously, you know, that they've never heard before in their life. So therefore, right. I don't right. think it's really comparable, you know, to say that um, I think that both language and the myths that we under that we um, play out or don't understand fully tap into the unconscious because 
you know, like these myths, though we may not understand them, but have symbols, just like the snake, you know, and that taps more into our unconscious than, you know, the electric. Yeah, well, I think, I think it's reasonable. Like Ch Noam Chomsky, who, who, whose name you're undoubtedly familiar with, is a very thin linguist at MIT. He's posited the existence of a language acquisition device, which is not really all that uh, informative a uh, concept, because it doesn't really say what it is. But he says, well, you need the capacity to develop language, as well as exposure to the appropriate environmental stimuli. And I'd, I, would, I really do think that something similar operates at the mythological level. It's like we're hardwired to appreciate the structure of a narrative. I mean, otherwise, you don't, I mean, how else do you explain the capacity of children to be interested in stories? It's not like you teach them that. It's that if they weren't bloody well interested in stories, you couldn't teach them anything. It's like that's the precondition, right? What, you can grab that and then use it to funnel information into them, but you don't teach that. It's there first. And I think that's a, well, I think that's a form of grammar. And really what we're looking at in, in, in large part is the grammar of mythology. So like your recognition of heroic behavior in that boy is like a pattern. I mean, it's not like a process of, of inference from just discrete behaviors. Right. The boy does this. And I, I don't, yeah, right. I mean, rather, that may contribute to it. But it's rather it's recognition of a pattern of behavior. That's right. That to, to so, he matches, that's exactly right. It's he matches a pattern that's latent in me, I guess. Or could it be a pattern you learn as a child with your parents? Well. It could be. I mean, you can you can make a, a plausible case for the mechanistic for the mechanistic acquisition of some of this sort of thing, except for the fact that imitative behavior seems, in some ways, pre-abstract, and also that <coughs> I don't think children learn to be interested in stories. I really don't. <coughs> I think they have that first. Well, they have everything useful comes to us in the form of a story or a pattern of some sort, then it makes sense evolutionarily that there's going to be huge selective pressure to be interested in patterns and stories. Well, if that's how if that's how you learn to behave, I mean, yes, it is the case that, well, here's an example. This is a good example. I went to Montreal last week and talked, I'm, I'm working on an experimental project there dealing with children who fight in school. So we have a population of kids that were tracked from kindergarten right till they graduated, basically, and in six of the first ten years of their schooling, they were rated by teachers for fighting. So we can identify kids who are stable fighters over the long term. Now, what's interesting about these kids is, you know, you hear the standard routine about antisocial personalities is they don't feel any anxiety, for example. But these kids are extraordinarily anxious. And uh, I just had an honors student write me a thesis about men who abuse their wives enough to be brought to the attention of courts and convicted. Um, they tend to be criminal, as you'd suspect, have lower IQs, but they're very, very, very anxious and depressed, which again doesn't fit very well with the classic picture of antisocial personality. It looks more like an antisocial personality. Feels anxious, but can't use that anxiety to regulate their behavior. Those two phenomena being separable. Just to say, you could be very, very anxious, but unless you know what to do with the information, it's not very useful. And there's a lot of reasons for believing that's true. Um, anyways, I, I still want to stay focused on your question. OK, so you have these kids. I'm trying to figure, what are these kids like? Well, they're aggressive mm, because they fight. And teachers rate them as fighting. That's the one thing we really know about them. But they're very anxious and they're very depressed. The, the gentleman I'm working with there has been studying antisocial behavior in children for a long time. Um, He's, I've told you before that children's aggressive behavior peaks at two and then goes downhill from there. Uh, you're more aggressive at two than you are at any other time in your life. You get socialized somewhere around between two and three. You learn these behavioral patterns. What happens if you don't learn them? That's the question, and that, that's what's relevant to your, your topic. Well, Tremblay said, and he's the character who runs this study, he said, you know, when you're an adult and you don't fit into your peer group, like you really don't fit in, you get put in prison. Said, these kids in kindergarten, they're already in prison. There's just no walls around them. Which is to say that because they haven't learned the proper behavioral rituals, they're ostracized by their peer groups. So they don't fit into the standard hierarchy. Outside that hierarchy, they build their own hierarchy. 
and it's based on force. The toughest kid, so all the kids who get thrown out cluster, and the toughest kid wins, and that's the genesis of not only the antisocial personality, but that whole antisocial lifestyle. It's the same in prisons. Right? The dominance hierarchy in prison is like the meanest son of a bitch rules. Well, that's because outside of the proper dominance hierarchy, the proper dominance hierarchy being normal socialized behavior, that's the default strategy for the erection of dominance hierarchy. The most natural uh, moral system. That's what Nietzsche was always. Well, about. it's the most. No. Mm, it's the most natural if you're if you're very impaired. It's, dis but it's the most functional. That's right. It's it's, it's the most it's, primitive. Then I mean, it's, that's it's, well, in a right. in a sense, it's well, it's what you'll come to if you're not given anything else. Right, right. That's right. It's what you'll come to if you're not given anything else. That's a good way of putting it. So when you say, well, it's very important to pick up on the appropriate sorts of behaviors. Well, this, that's a story about why it's so important. And if you don't learn to be properly pro-social, like these kids, they don't. If someone else is hurt, they won't go over to comfort them. They don't know how to, even if you're highly aggressive and you fight a lot and you're quite anxious and depressed, if you're helpful and you know how to share, that's enough to get you into the group. It's, it's if you're lacking even the most rudimentary forms of, of non-aggressive social behavior, then you're an outcast. And that's the consequence of not picking up these initial for whatever reason. So yeah, the consequences are very severe. So these kids, by the way, I think, they're the ones that are indiscriminately reinforced because that's how you ruin a child. It's like you, you make sure that the rewards and punishments they receive are completely uncorrelated with their behavior because that makes them powerless That's right. completely and makes the world a very frustrating place. I remember I had a friend in adolescence. He drove a white truck and that truck was dented on every quarter panel as a pickup truck, including inside quarter panels where various parts of people's bodies had come into contact with with the dash or the roof or whatever. Uh, before he was 16, he wrecked four or five vehicles. The most dramatic example of which was one day I went, had a job in the, on the main street of our small town in the middle of winter. I looked up the street about three blocks and there was a small convenience store there with a truck parked halfway inside of it, covered with a tarp, <laughs> and it was a white truck. And I thought, that's very likely my friend. Anyways, he was indiscriminately reinforced because every time he wrecked a truck, he just got out of way. He knew what he ever said. Stop. Anyways, okay. So back. What now? Were there other? Are there other questions? Okay, let's go. Yeah. Okay, so it's the difference between someone like I don't know much about Buddha, but maybe Jesus or something. Uh, could you say that a lot of the behaviors that they learned came from their parents, and then they added to that in their in their lifetime? So, is the difference between that and a, and, a, and a child who doesn't, who is antisocial, whatever, is that they are they are they are not given the opportunity to learn um, those adaptive behaviors or social behaviors, whatever, they, because of the peer group ostracizing them? Yeah. Well, I guess I guess if you, if you thought about it in this term is. Well, those kids are even fouled up at this point. It's hard to it's hard to say how because they don't ever have anyone reliably that they can depend on even in childhood. It's like this success here is a precondition for success here. That's right. These kids are identifiable at kindergarten. Like they didn't even get to the point where they're acceptable to a peer group. So the question is, what happens to you if you don't even make it here? I guess what happens is that you're thrown out into chaos where you organize yourself according to the principle we just discussed, which is, what can you do when you can't do anything else? The answer being, hurt. Right? It doesn't really, and that, that of course is pretty much just dependent on your, on how mean you are and your size, I guess. So, okay. Okay, I'm going to read you something from Tolstoy, and this will help us discuss <coughs> the different sorts of, the different manners in which anomalous information can present itself. This is in Tolstoy's Confessions. I remember that when I was 11 years old, a high school boy named Volodinka, now long since dead, 
visited us one Sunday with an announcement of the latest discovery made at school. The discovery was that there is no God, and that the things they were teaching us were nothing but fairy tales. This was in 1838. I remember how this news captured the interest of my older brothers. They even let me in on their discussions. I remember that we were all very excited that we took this news to be both engaging and entirely possible. Okay. Tolstoy's confessions are basically a description of the consequences of having been exposed to that piece of information on his entire life. And it is the case, or it was the case for him, that at least by his own interpretation, the dramatic consequences of that discovery didn't manifest themselves fully in his consciousness until he was middle-aged and well, well established as a successful author. Say, well, he hit a piece of he hit a piece of anomalous information while he was pursuing some relatively trivial task, and was unable to determine the proper magnitude of that anomalous information for perhaps forty years. It kept moving up the hierarchy of stories, destroying them as it went. Because his, as Nietzsche pointed out, Judeo-Christian morality, which characterized the behavior of the Russians in 1838, is predicated on the idea that there is a God. That's the most fundamental presupposition. And if you blow that presupposition, then you blow the morality. Now, you may not know that it's gone, but the fact, just the fact that you don't know that it's gone doesn't necessarily mean that it will, yeah. it'll disappear whether you know it's gone or not. Nietzsche said at one point that if you kill the roots of a tree, eventually the branches will die. It might take a long period of time. Anyways, Tolstoy said, since ancient times when the life of which I do know something began, People who knew the arguments concerning the vanity of life, the arguments that revealed to me its meaninglessness, lived nonetheless, bringing to life a meaning of their own. Since the time when people somehow began to live, this meaning of life has been with them, and they have led this life up to my own time. Everything that is in me and around me is the fruit of their knowledge of life. The very tools of thought by which I judge life and condemn it were created not by me but by them. I was born, educated, and have grown up thanks to them. They dug out the iron, taught us how to cut the timber, tamed the cattle and the horses, showed us how to sow crops and live together. They brought order to our lives as the mythological ancestors. They taught me how to think and how to speak. I am their offspring, nursed by them, reared by them, taught by them. I think according to their thoughts, their words. And now I have proved to them that it is all meaningless. It happened with me as it happens with everyone who contracts a fatal internal disease. At first there were the insignificant symptoms of an ailment which the patient ignores. Then these symptoms recur more and more frequently until they merge into one continuous duration of suffering. The suffering increases and before he can turn around the patient discovers what he already knew. The thing he had taken for a mere indisposition is in fact the most important thing on earth to him is in fact death. And that's a story of the information moving up the hierarchy of stories, I think. It's, I guess that his, 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 his comments there, are, you could draw an analogy to, to discovering that you have a fatal illness. I mean, let's say you wake up one morning and uh, he says, and he, he makes the, uses the metaphor of fatal illness. You, know, you have a stitch in your side, and you think, well, that's going to make it much more difficult to get to work. So you construe the anomalous event with regards to, to a particular story, right? You say, well, this, this thing which I am now encountering has the status of a minor inconvenience, right? You say it's only going to interfere with a story that's nested way down, but it, it doesn't go away and perhaps it gets worse and you start to wonder, well, perhaps it's more serious than I thought, which means there's more to this bit of anomalous information than first met the eye. It's sore enough the next day so that you have to stay in bed. So then you start thinking, well, what's the proper level of analysis to consider this anomalous information with respect to? You don't know. Well, then you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, well, you need some more tests. Well, this bit of information is starting to think of it. 
And this is the best way to think of it. It's only metaphor, although it's only metaphor. Wherever something anomalous occurs, there's a hole in the way that you look at the world. And that hole can widen or narrow depending on your interpretation. And what you see through the hole is the unknown. And your job, in a sense, is to keep all the holes covered. Now here's something, the unknown is peeping its head through. And you don't know how big the thing that's peeping its head through is. It's just the tail of a dragon or just the nose of a dragon. Well, what you're trying to do is to figure it out. So I guess um, interjecting anomaly would be a good way to find out what someone's dominance hierarchy is. Go ahead. How do you mean? Well, use the example of, uh, use the example of an athlete. Um, let's say that you get the stitch and you get some uh, stitch in your side. And at first you think to yourself, well, you know, this is make it difficult for me to get through my day. And you keep going and um, it gets worse and worse. And you see what level of analysis they take it to next. Do they next say, well, I need to, this will, because this will interfere with my, my schoolwork, do I need to um, lay off my sports? Or is it the other way around? That, I guess that would be an example. Right, oh, I see, I see what you mean. With the status of the various nested um, goals and subjects right. are. You right. can see that by right. forcing so, someone into an anomaly. I, I see what you're saying. So if I put a limitation on your behavior, or if one emerges, you're going to determine what's worth tossing and that'll give you what's worth throwing away, basically. Like, if, if you can only do 90% of the things that you're doing right now, what falls into the category of the 10% that can be eliminated? Sort of. But I think more along the lines of what are the order in which you'll consider them. Yes, yes, fair enough, fair enough. So, yeah, well, that's... To be yeah. yeah, well, I think that's perhaps part of the reason why, uh, you know, people who, who have recovered from a very serious illness, or sometimes people who aren't even going to recover say, well, at least this has taught me what was important. So that's, that's a, a perfectly reasonable observation. So anyways, you go to the doctor, and what your attempt is when you ask the doctor what is going on, what you're basically saying is, like, what subsection of my nested stories is this event going to destroy? Right? That's what you want to determine. I read, this is quite interesting, you see it's, and that's a terrible situation to be in. So you're at the doctor and you're faced with something that's unknown. So that, then you're very anxious. I read all the educational attempts so far to convince homosexual men to use condoms have resulted in failure globally, by the way. Um, when AIDS first manifested itself, there was a decrease in the kind of behavior that spreads AIDS and an increase in use of condoms for a, for a substantial period of time. But now that AIDS is sort of run of the mill, so to speak, the behaviors have basically returned to baseline level. And there is some studies that demonstrate that men who engage in extremely high-risk sexual behavior are more anxious and depressed before they are diagnosed with AIDS than after. And the reason for that, I think, is that any possibility is better. Is better. That's right, that's right. Any defined actuality is better than the unknown. And that's, that's a good story for illustrating how that's the case. Like, it's better to know than not to know, no matter what it is that you know. Does that mean that uh, threat is worse than punishment in the same yes, way? Yes, that that's what it means. That that's what it means. Worse. That's why that's why in psychotherapy, people will always will continue to do things that they know will hurt them, rather than risk change. It's threat. That's right. That's what people are like. Hope is better than reward. and. Punishment is better than threat. Right. So our primary reinforcers are less salient than our secondary reinforcers. That's peculiar. Yeah. It is peculiar. It is peculiar. But I, I think that is the case. Because it is drugs that, for, well, it is drugs that activate our, our, the systems that mediate hope that we find most enthralling. And it is the case. I do believe that, like, the devil you know is the better than the one you don't. That, it's the, it's the, that, that's one of the reasons why this sort of theoretical approach is so useful. It's because it gives you insight to why people won't change. But why won't they change? Well, in order to change, you have to stop believing in and stop doing what you're doing. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means for an intermediary period of time, all things are novel. And all novel things produce anxiety. And if you're terrified of anxiety and you don't believe you can cope with it, well, you can't do it. So one of the jobs you have as a psychotherapist is not to minimize the anxiety that your patient feels, but to endeavor to demonstrate to them that they can tolerate more of it than they think. Right. Right. That's catalog, 
that's your attempt to catalyze identification with the hero. It, the, the fact of anxiety isn't so bad. It's the fact that you think that you can't deal with it. That's what's so bad. Because you're never going to convince anybody that the world is not a threatening place. So, okay. Anyway, so one of the things that you're doing when you engage in exploratory behavior is trying to figure out at what level of analysis that particular anomalous piece of information actually, where it's actually most appropriately conceived of, which is to say, what does it mean? Right? You're trying to fit it into a framework. Well, Tolstoy basically says that well, his, this piece of information that he accidentally encountered at school, which was pretty much inevitable, you know, the Russians in 1838 were still pretty backward society compared to the rest of Europe. And Europe had gone through its, its great contact with the idea that God was dead as early as, as, the, as the times when Galileo came into conflict with the, with the Catholic Church. And this had been going on in Europe for a long time, for 400 years before the news washed in from Western Europe over Russia. Russia was a feudal society that was tottering on very... On, on shaky legs, just ready, just waiting in a sense for something to push it over. Uh, the news from Western Europe pushed it over. It took Tolstoy 30 years to figure out, or for the information to have its full impact on Tolstoy. And I would say that I think it's reasonable to say that what that information did to Tolstoy, it did to the whole culture 50 years later. That's why I want you to read Dostoevsky's The Devils, right? because Dostoevsky was writing about a Russia that had held on to feudalism 200, 300 years longer than it actually should have. It was the last European country to undergo a, a, mo a modern revolution. Well, we know the consequences of the revolution. It's orthodox Christianity was pushed over, left a huge void in the Russian psyche that was filled by Marxism. Anyways, Tolstoy was a genius, and one of the consequences of being a genius is that those things that eventually happen to everyone happen to you first. So. That's, that's an interesting thing, you know, it seems to me that we, we t this, is, this is a strange, strange thing to think, I guess. We tend to think that the future happens everywhere at the same time. It's like we all come into contact with the future at the same time, but that's not really true, you know. The people that we think of as geniuses are people in whom the future happens first. And that usually isolates them. That's why they look like prophets, I, I think, in a sense. It's almost as if the future pours through them first, then out into the culture. I mean, it depends on what, it depends on what you think of thinking. If you think of thinking as something you do, then that whole line of argument is nonsensical. But if you think of thoughts as something you encounter, then, uh, then it starts to make a little bit more sense. Anyways, the thing he had taken for a mere indisposition is in fact the most important thing on earth for him, is in fact death. This is exactly what happened to me. I realized that this was not an incidental ailment, but something very serious, and that if the same questions should continue to recur, I would have to answer them. And I tried to answer them. The questions seemed to be such foolish, simple, childish questions. But as soon as I laid my hands on them and tried to resolve them, I was immediately convinced, first of all, that they were not childish and foolish but the most vital and profound questions in life. And secondly, that no matter how much I pondered them, there was no way I could resolve them. So Tolstoy had not only got here, he was the paradigmatic example of having got there. Right? He was as successful as you could possibly be within the confines of a group, and even perhaps had made some movements towards the next stage of development, given that he was undoubtedly a very creative individual. So he says it he says himself. I should have been considered a completely happy man. This was when I was not yet 50 years old. I had a good, loving, and beloved wife, fine children, and a large estate that was growing and expanding without any effort on my part. More than ever before, I was respected by friends and acquaintances, praised by strangers and could claim a certain renown without really deluding myself. Moreover, I was not physically and mentally unhealthy. On the contrary, I enjoyed a physical and mental vigor such as I had rarely encountered among others my age. Physically, I could keep up with the peasants working in the fields. Mentally, I could work eight and ten hours at a stretch. 
without suffering any after effects from the strain. And in such a state of affairs, I came to a point where I could not live. And even though I feared death, I had to employ ruses against myself to keep from committing suicide. A perfect example of an entirely well-adapted man, he encountered a piece of anomalous information that blew his ability to believe in all of the determinant meanings that his group identification had provided for him. And as a consequence, he descended involuntarily into chaos and just about died as a consequence. He said, and he details this to some degree in his confessions, I mean, Tolstoy literally was suicidal for a long period of time. So. It seems to be one of the tragic consequences of abstraction. I mean, this is it's coming from the top down there. It's right. Like, and there's no right. reason why you should be unhappy from a practical point of view. Right. Well, that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to sort of deal with today. Is, I mean, th this story, this story is this, right? I mean, what Tolstoy encountered was a strange idea. And the problem with an idea, and this is, again, why, that, why the pen is mightier than the sword. The problem with an idea is that once it's up here, you can just say it. Like you can make your point in, in a paragraph or two. Say if the point is, uh, it's absurd to believe in religious presuppositions, and you buttress that with a page of, or two of documentation of the reasons why it's absolutely obvious that it's absurd, then you're you're providing information whose ease of communication belies its danger and also obscures how difficult it was for the information to have been generated. That's the thing about abstraction is that for me to make a statement like that meant over a long span of time that any number of people may have had to die in order to make that information, in order to generate that information. And I think that's part of the reason why we're so constantly interested in the story of Galileo, right? He was someone who produced a piece of anomalous information and was branded a heretic by the Catholic Church. And he was the he was a person who opened the doorway for the for the scientific overthrow of religious ideas. Um, but the fact that we can calmly discuss issues like that now is a consequence of the fact that centuries of battles about ideas like this have taken in have taken place in the past, sometimes purely intellectually, sometimes as the consequence of actual wars, all compacted up into a few abstracted phrases that can easily be delivered, also delivered across cultures. That's so you can see the actions of strangers can become abstracted up into words and then transmitted. Well, that's the thing that's so funny is that once it's abstracted, you can be a very ineffectual personality and nonetheless have the capability to have a huge impact on things because you can serve as the carrier of information that you could not possibly have generated yourself. And that's part of the reason why our technological power makes us so increasingly dangerous, I think, is because we have access to all the power that people have developed in the past regardless of whether or not we have the kind of personalities that are capable of using that power uh, wisely. So... It's politics in a nutshell. Right. Not just politics, though. It's the case with every field of endeavor. You know, it, it doesn't matter where you look. It's the case. And as, as we develop our technological power more and more, that's increasingly the case. I mean, that's why someone like, I don't remember his name, uh, character in, the, in Southeast Asia who brought down Bering's Bank. That's a good example of the power of abstraction. That's right. He's playing with nothing and devastated a whole community. He's just playing with abstraction. They were just numbers. They're bits even. But because things had been abstracted up so, so tremendously, his casual movements had huge impact. Well, what makes an anomalous idea threatening um, and not just uh, ridiculous? I mean, uh, why Gal Galileo's suppositions were threatening? Why were they perceived as, as I mean, not as suppositions, but I mean, as speculations or as theory was considered threatening? That's why a really was it good. That's a really good question. I suspect. Look, that's a really good question because it also ties in with other peculiarities. Like Jung pointed out, for example, that 
well, and everyone knows this to be the case. You know, sometimes you're a prophet crying in the wilderness, which basically means that you have a message that no one will listen to, and the reason for that is, well, it might be because you're, you know, you're, you're fundamentally deranged, and what you have to say has no relevance. But it also may be that you're so far ahead of your time, so to speak, that no one that you talk to can understand what you're saying, which is very much related to the question that you're asking. I guess I would say that there must be an op... Then this, this, this ties into the last chapter that we'll discuss, which has to do with the ability to use your interest as a mode of regulating your progress. Vygotsky said there's a zone of proximal development and this is a complicated thing to try to understand, and I, I really haven't got it completely straightened out, although this diagram helps a bit. You're saying, if you're faced with an anomalous piece of information, what makes it meaningful instead of incomprehensible? And it must be that there must be, like if the idea is here, maybe it's pretty easy to move it to here. But maybe it's pretty difficult to move it to here if it's here. So I would say, like the reason that the reason that the Russians, Tolstoy for example, was so overwhelmed by the idea from Europe is because at other levels of analysis they already knew the idea. So it was like dropping a, a seed crystal into a super saturated solution. It was the ground was already prepared. And I also think that's why people sometimes experience things as revelations is they already know, you already know. So I tell you a piece of information. This is very much relevant to mythological teachings because, again, what we're discussing in this class, everyone knows at least up to about here already. So when you say, move it to here, well, I can always make reference to what you already know here. Also, uh, that's... So I, I sit with my children and I watch Bugs Bunny cartoons, or any movie for that matter. There, and the oldest one is four. And I see by watching my daughter how much of what's portrayed on the movie is opaque information. And that's because she doesn't understand any of the references. Like yesterday we were watching Casper. She doesn't know what a ghost is. Now you can't really explain to anyone what a ghost is, you know, because, well, you think about it, that's complicated. I mean, it's really complicated. You have to, there are a lot of presuppositions involved in understanding what a ghost is. For her, that's just opaque information. It's because she doesn't share, like the movie, all the movie presumes a certain shared frame of reference, right? A shared background knowledge. And that's, yeah, that's, that's. Is it, is it related to the way of knowing and not just the idea? I mean, the, um, The church had a way of knowing. Galileo had a different way of knowing. Right. It wasn't just the idea that was new. It was a way of knowing. That yes, was that, that was certainly true in, in, in his case. That's right. Well, that's because the, like, the church, I think, was most concerned, although it didn't know that explicitly, with the knowing as knowing how to behave. Mm -hmm. Whereas Galileo was on the track of knowing as knowing facts. Mm -hmm. And, well... We know what the consequences mm -hmm. of that have been. We haven't been able to distinguish them very well. But, you know, if you, I noticed wandering through various art museums in Europe, I mean, I don't understand many of the Renaissance paintings. They don't mean to me, they don't even look to me like they look to the people who painted them because I don't know the mythological reference, even the Christian ones for that matter. A lot of the paintings lost on me. And that's because. If we share a community, that means our unconscious presuppositions are identical. And so we can communicate at a level where having those shared presuppositions as implicitly accepted, we can toss information back and forth at, at, like, at the level of abstraction where we don't yet agree. I guess that must be the story. Well, if you and I are talking, there's a whole bunch of things we're not talking about that we already agree about. And so we don't have to talk about them. What we talk about are those things that, at a level of analysis, where there's still some dispute. And I guess that as things become increasingly beyond dispute, they all also get encoded farther back down the hierarchy. So, like in this class, for example, we're not at each other's throats, ever. 
because, and we don't ever argue about the propriety of that. It's, it's so much accepted that it's not even an issue. There's no aggressive behavior in here. Uh, it seems to me that part of this fear of, uh, of anomaly must uh, come from a recognition, or an unconscious recognition perhaps, of human nature, which is that uh, exploration is intrinsically rewarding. I mean, would you, would you agree that that is true? It seems that, uh, I mean, exploration for exploration's sake seems to be something that motivates people. I mean, I noticed one of the things that Tolstoy said was that he and his, he and his brothers, they, they brought this strange idea home from school, and one of the first things he says is that we were more than, you know, we were more than happy to entertain this idea. Right. Why? But simply because it's it's new and anything that's new is interesting. Right, right, interesting right. Is rewarding. Right. Yeah, well they were definitely interested in the information. Partly I think because it told them something they already suspected, so to speak. Yeah, yeah there was a receptivity. Right, right. The a ground was prepared. To receive it and it's almost as if uh, there was an unarticulated experience. Right, that absolutely. The idea provides a way of articulating. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the crystal that hits the water. Right. But it doesn't put the experience there. It it articulates. The right. Right. It, well, okay. There's a there's a, you'll see this later in the manuscript too. Um, when Moses gets the rules, the Ten Commandments from God, he's on the top of a mountain, which is a standard place of enlightenment. When he comes down, or illumination, when he comes down the mountain, his face is glowing so brightly that no one can look at it. Now, what Moses did, like he's a, let's assume for the present time that if he is not a mythological figure, he's at least a mythicized historical figure. I mean, the notion of the lawgiver is fairly prevalent in archaic communities. I mean, the same role is played by Hammur Hammurabi, for example, someone who codifies the law. Well, the notion there is, again, that like what Moses did basically could be construed as having observed how everyone behaved in essence anyways, he codified it, right? So he took information that existed at the level of creative behavior, imitation, play, ritual, drama, myth, religion, and maybe even literature, and he said, well, look, this is what we're doing. Like, and the consequence of that, that appeared as a revelation. I think part of the reason, I mean, I've been trying to figure, because you do this in therapy too, eh? You say to someone, look, here, here's a pattern of behavior. First of all, that in itself can be a revelation, you say. The person says, yeah, you know, I've noticed myself doing that. They're quite interested in that piece of information. I think the affect that's generated as a consequence of encountering that sort of information is partly due to apprehension of all the possibilities that are then revealed. Like, the more, as you move information up the hierarchy of abstraction, the information becomes more and more powerful, which basically means that you can do more with it with less work. Right? That's why money is more powerful than barter. It's more abstract, so, that, so it's more flexible. And I think when you move information up a level of abstraction, it produces a, a release of affect because you get an intimation of the possibilities that are released as a consequence of the increase in abstraction. I also think it's the case that if I can tell you, well, look, your story is such and such, but you act this way, and this is your theory, well, then you have the possibility of moving those three levels of analysis into an isomorphic arrangement so that you're not three people anymore. One who acts some way, one who imagines another way, and one who plans a third way, you're one person, all of whose efforts are devoted towards attaining the same end. I also think that that's, well, that's, that's the, the utility of integration. And I think when, one of the things that we admire in people naturally, I think, is the consequence of the unification of the operation of those three systems, which is to say, who do you admire? Well, someone who doesn't say anything more than is necessary, so to speak, and who acts out what they tell you. Um, I was about to say that I think it's, you're talking about positive affect, and I think that positive affect works in this direction if you're talking about <coughs> procedural as the outside and uh, abstraction towards the middle. And it, <coughs> because I think that, um, I think when you present, once you have a level of abstraction, the best way to present to somebody else is not by 
by telling them, but by presenting it in as procedural, in, in as big a, a, a circle as possible, which is probably which is probably more difficult to do. Um, but well, this sort of the, okay <coughs> information that's behavioral, anyways. Yeah. yeah. So well, that's Freud thought that merely becoming conscious of something was sufficient to bring about a cure, at least at the early stages of his career. But by the end, he realized that unless it had been transformed from pure conscious awareness. <laughs> back down to the level of behavior, that it, you didn't know it. Knowing it means that it's embodied. I think that's the point that you're but making. But it seems what, what Tolstoy was doing is that he was moving from abstraction, maybe, into procedural, and right. that, that produced negative affect. Um, yeah, but it wouldn't, it, yeah, in this, I would say, I would say that your interpretation is accurate, but that it wouldn't necessarily have to produce negative affect. The problem is, is that Tolstoy encountered that information involuntarily. It was sort of accidental, in a sense. He was walking along as a... It's a hell of a piece of information for a 12-year-old schoolboy. You know, it's like... It's a piece of information that you can say in one sentence, God is dead, that took, like, literally thousands of years of concentrated effort and any number of wars to produce, and then you can hand it to someone on a plate. This is also part of the reason why our, this is, this is kind of a leap, but it makes it, it, it's exactly the same sort of thing. It's why a lot of foreign aid pro projects don't work, is because there's a lot more information embedded in the things that we distribute than we think. But there's a good example. Um, in, the, in the South Pacific Islands, the introduction of steel axes to the Stone Age population devastated their whole culture. In part of it was missionary work. But the thing is, these cultures had progressed to the point where if you were at the top of the dominance hierarchy, you had access to a stone axe. And we think about stone axe, you know, who cares, basically. But when there aren't that many of them, and when that's the thing that's the, the, the most technologically advanced product you have, a stone axe is a symbol of ultimate value as well as a stone axe. And when you distribute steel axes, which the missionaries did relatively indiscriminately, it was very hard on the story that the Pacific Islanders told, because you think, what does that mean? It's like, okay, it's a steel axe. What's a steel axe for? Well, it's for cutting down trees, and you can do a better job with the steel axe than you can with the stone axe. But the thing is, it's like Elvis Presley's guitar, right? Elvis Presley's guitar is, just, is not just a thing to make music with. It's also Elvis Presley's guitar. And a steel axe is not just a thing to cut down trees with. It's a cultural artifact that has sort of embedded in it a whole bunch of implicit messages partly about the relative power of two cultures and well, in large part that. It's like if you have to work your whole life to get a stone axe and then your four year old child walks down the street and brings home a steel axe, this is going to be somewhat hard on your on your uh, on your frame of reference. Like, hey dad, the, the people down the street are giving away machines that create money. So Anyways, so when we introduce our artifacts into alternative cultures, we are putting a lot more into the culture than we actually think, because the artifact, it's like Marshall McLuhan said, that the medium is the message. The artifact is something other than just a tool. It has a story that's embedded in it. So now in, in Tolstoy's case, it's almost, the artifact was rather a story. I mean, it was an yeah, idea. That yeah, it was an idea. Crystallized an experience that was already there. Right. Right. Almost the opposite in a way. Well, yeah, it was something it was something abstracted up anyways. So okay, so anyways, well, anomalous information can come in the form of a strange idea. I guess what I was trying to do with this uh, with this is something I didn't really recognize until this morning when I was working on this stuff again. Anomalous information can, can enter your purview at every at any level of abstraction. I guess that's what it means, is that someone can, if someone acts differently than you act, say, well, why does that bother you so much? The mere, let's take the Germans, for example, prior to the Second World War. Okay, their culture is a little unstable as it, as it is. Very high rates of unemployment, terrible inflation, an immense threat of communism from the East, and a non-trivial threat. I mean, the communists took over Russia, after all. So, you know, there's enough novelty and enough anomaly floating around in the air, so to speak, to make everyone perfectly well uncomfortable um, under those circumstances. Anybody who acted differently was uh, additional anomaly that I think appeared as pretty much, as something pretty much intolerable. So, 
Under normal circumstances, it's possible that the alternative behaviors of someone who's different than you aren't going to pose that much of a problem to you, but all you have to do is perturb the system to some degree to make that sort of anomalous information that much more intolerable. Stay. If someone's from a culture that's different than you, even if you don't talk to them, and even if they don't come into contact with you that much, the mere fact that they're around is definitive evidence that a story that isn't your story can be as success can make someone as successful as you are, or perhaps even more successful. Sometimes you can tolerate that, and sometimes you can't. So, anomalous information can come in the form of pure procedure that's acted out by someone else. And, uh, Sometimes that's not a problem, but sometimes it is. The final, this is even less abstract, I guess. I wanted to read you something, because I, uh, I can't make the argument as, as well as I wrote it. <laughs> Page 168. The question here is, what can disrupt you, I guess? And the things that can disrupt you can come in the form of direct challenges, or indirect challenges to your cultural structure. And these are all things that are other cultures, basically, right? Or, sorry, these two things are other cultures. The stranger and the strange idea. This is schismatic movement within your own culture. And this is the unknown doing its thing, more or less, all by itself. So, cultures come to a halt. Well, let's say your culture, this is a good example, I suppose. You raise goats. Uh, so you have an agrarian culture. The problem with goats is that they, pr they produce environmental transformations. Goats like to live in deserts. And the thing about goats is that if you put them out somewhere, soon what you have is a desert. And the problem with deserts is that they don't support that many goats. <laughs> so the point is, is that if you have an adaptive structure of one sort, the consequences of that adaptive structure can be the transformation of the environment in such a way so that the adaptive structure no longer, no longer works. Um, now, this took me a long time to, to work out because mythological representations of the emergence of the negative unknown are always contaminated with mythological representations of the tyranny of the known. It's almost as if from the mythological perspective that there's no difference between the overdominance of this and the emergence of this. And I thought, how the hell could that be? So why would that be? Let me just read you something here. The insufficiency of cultural adaptation cannot easily be distinguished from natural catastrophe. The society, like on its feet, so to speak, is constantly in a position to adapt to the unexpected, even to the rapid and catastrophic unexpected even to transform such change into something positively beneficial. Likewise, this means that affect and cognition are in... Oh, I won't bother with that. Think, it's a funny... Think about it this way. Germany and Japan lost the Second World War, and England won. You'd never know it now. And that's partly because... Well, it's partly because the Americans, in a fit of historical anomaly, uh, you gave their enemies money instead of killing them all and plowing their land. The best land thing a country can do historically is lose, to a, lose a war against Yeah, to America. the United States. Yeah. And the only country that's ever really won, won a war against us is Vietnam, and look where they are now. Right. Whereas right. you look at Japan and Germany, and, well, we've but this, but made it. it it's, a, it's a good example of, of the integral relationship between this and this, because the Germans and the Japanese underwent a catastrophe, uh, a sociological catastrophe, whose consequence was something very beneficial in the final analysis. And the point is, is that it's, you can't necessarily distinguish 
the valence of an unexpected phenomena from the pattern of behavior that's manifested in its presence, which is to say that it's very difficult to specify a particular situation that is in and of itself negative without any relationship to how you act in the face of that thing. So let me let me read you. You have to think about this from, from the perspective of image. Myth and literature constantly represent the parched kingdom, the society victimized most frequently by drought, which is the absence of water concretely and the water of life or spirit symbolically. It's scorched as a consequence of the over-prolonged dominance of the ruling idea. This idea in the narrative, and frequently in actuality, is the king, the ancestral spirit, representative of his people, made tyrannical by age or pride, unbearable disappointment, or withering under the influence of some malevolent advising force. Development of such circumstances call, of course, for the entrance of the hero, who is the lost son of the true king, raised in secrecy by alternative parents, the rightful ruler of the kingdom, whose authority was undermined during vulnerable youth or who had been journeying in far off lands and was presumed dead. The hero overturns the tyrant and regains his proper place. The gods, pleased by the reestablishment of proper order, allow the rain once more to fall. In a story of this type, the creative aspect of the unknown, or nature, is locked away metaphorically by the totalitarian opinion of the current culture. Such a state of affairs might be represented, for example, by the sleeping princess in the kingdom brought to a standstill, or by some alternative variant of the existence of the treasure hard to attain. Paralyzed by patriarchal despotism, or frequently by fear of the terrible mother, the kingdom remains stagnant while the princess, nature in her benevolent guise, waits for the kiss of the hero to awake. Her awakened and revitalized beauty subsequently reanimates her people. Yeah. See, these stories basically say that if the unknown if the environment has turned if the environment has turned against you kill the king because whether you know it or not he's a tyrant and so from the mythological perspective, there's no such thing as the negative aspect of the unknown as such. It's always only negative in relationship to a ruling idea. And the mythological idea is that if it's negative, there's something wrong with the ruling idea. That's the basic notion. It's a strange idea. And yeah, that's the opposite of circling the wagons, though. Sorry, you have to elaborate on that. I mean, like, like like uh, becoming more rigidly right. uh, holding on to your right. Uh, right. idea when faced it's with not precisely the It's not precisely the opposite because... Can you repeat that again? Okay, and then I'll, I'll, get, yeah. uh, I'll get back to this. <clears throat> if, the, uh, if the environment has become, has turned against you, then that's a sign that it's time to sacrifice the king. Because this, the unknown is only negative in relationship to an idea. We already know that, right? I mean, that's what we've been talking about with regards to the structure of these stories all along. Is that you construe the motivational valence of something with respect to your current story. So the mythological story basically says if negative things are happening all around you, it's not the environment as an objective thing. There's something wrong with the way you're living. That's why, well, say in an archaic society, an archaic society this actually frequently happens. Is if things aren't working out, like there's a prolonged drought, it's time to kill the king. Well, you think, what a stupid idea that is. You know, what the hell does the king have to do with the drought? But the point of this, the point of the story is that the environment, in large part, is a consequence of your adaptive response in its presence, at least in terms of its valence. So it's very intelligent to kill the king when things aren't going well, because after all, the king is the pattern of behavior that constitutes the kingdom, and if the kingdom isn't going very well, which means that the negative face of the great mother is constantly appearing, well, and who do you sacrifice him to? Well, you sacrifice him to the great mother, right, in hopes that her positive face will reappear. And the funny thing is, it works. This is another 
This is not yeah, that's a, like you, you people are going to have to evaluate these ideas over a long period of time, I, I suspect. But I'll tell you, I've never read anything anywhere that explains why people engaged in sacrificial rituals. Nothing that ever made any sense to me, although people did it all over the world. So this makes sense. It's ridiculous to think that people participate in activities like that in so many places over such long periods of time for no reason whatsoever. Well, this is the idea they were acting out. It's like, if what you're doing isn't working, kill it. Do something else. Good thinking. So I don't understand why it's, you have the why in that diagram. Yeah. Why are they opposite each other? I mean, well, it's the positive aspect of the, of culture that protects you from the negative aspect of the unknown. Right. So and it's stacked discs. Right? That's right. They're stacked discs. That's right. It would be better if you had uh, four if there were four faces, so that there so that the positive aspect of the cave could line up with the positive aspect of the great father, and so. Because in that, uh, okay, you'll have to shoot if you'll sketch that. I would appreciate it because I know that you're right. There's something like there's there's something missing from just this uh, side you here. see where the in the king where the negative sign is. Yeah. Well, just make it a make it a go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know either. I'll think about it. <laughs> no, no. I mean, that's well, but the thing isn't the idea that since they're stacked discs, the uh, the known blocks you from the. Yeah, but that still works, right? Because this is still inscribed inside the circle. So then the this right? Yes. No. Well, but then you have the you have the positive. I mean, if it's if it's thought of something that works by blocking, then you have the positive aspect of the known blocking the oh, right, right. positive aspect of the unknown, which is why in the other way you have the negative. But, yeah, right. But the well, negative, because the negative, of the, the negative of the negative of the... But the, that's true, therefore too, Therefore, you know. blocks the positive. This is true, too, though, because they say the good is the enemy of the better, which is to say that, you know, mm. well, you know what a Dvorak keyboard is? Well, a Dvorak keyboard... The keyboard on a computer is laid out so that you can type slowly. And the reason for that is because it was designed on a, for a manual typewriter, and really fast typists would jam the keys. So some bright character figured out how to separate the most commonly used keys so that a really fast typist couldn't jam a manual typewriter. Now, there's a Dvorak keyboard where the keys that you use most are laid out very close to each other, and you hardly have to move your fingers at all. Now, I would like to learn to use it. I'd like to learn to use a Dvorak keyboard. But I already know how to use the QWERTY keyboard. So I don't. And that means that what I know stops me from learning something. Because what I know is good enough. It stops me from learning something better. So I'm off to say, I mean, I see your objection. It makes sense. It's, sometimes it's hard to make well, I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying that you're sort of mixing meta the metaphor of blocking with the metaphor of uh, revealing. Right, right, right. Well, I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to keep this in mind and see if there's a way of balancing both. So then, where the reaction to threat in the environment is to cling more rigidly to the king as opposed to kill the king. Right. That would be the negative negative. I don't know. Will you get a double <laughs> whammy? <Are you? laughs> yes. That's right. I see what you mean. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. Good short-term solution, but no, in the long term, disastrous. It, yeah, all you're doing is accumulating. Yeah. What you're doing is like, here's a whole b bunch of disasters. You can have them one at a time, over a long span of time, or you can shove them all into a clump out there in the future and go along merrily until you fall into them and have them all at once. Right. So and that's basically the that's the authoritarian answer to the problem. Right. That's right? the circling the wagon. That's, that's right. right. Yes, yes, yes. But one of the things I want to make more clear in the second half of this manuscript, which isn't very well laid out right now, is that 
There are three patterns of response to a no. One is face it and do something about it, which is basically admit it's there, number one, and then engage in whatever modification of your story is necessary to produce something positive from your encounter with it. The second one is circle the wagons, which is to say some anomaly is facing me from outside. I'm afraid of anomaly because I've sacrificed my relationship with the hero. That's what an authoritarian does. I'm not creative like the emperor is creative for me. I just do what he says. When you circle the wagons, you also restrict the amount of novelty that exists within your constricted environment and dampen down your affect as a consequence, right? Because you make everyone the same, which is what authoritarians do. So that's one way of going about it wrong. The other way of going about it wrong is it's supposed to be the king is dead, long live the king. The wrong way of going about it is the king is dead. Period. And people are motivated to do that. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like you'd say, why the hell would someone do that? Because we already know that you need the king around or you're flooded with anxiety. So why kill him? Well, the thing is, people do that. You know, that's the anarchistic or rebellious sort of, sort of style of adaptation. But the problem with having a king is that you have to do what he says. And that's the price you pay for your security. You might be willing to get rid of him if you can't stand any responsibility. And that's the... That's the alternative improper mode of adaptation, I think. That's why you get this, right? In Chinese medicine, there's order and chaos. And if you're ill, it's because you have too much yin and not enough yang. Or you have too much yang and not enough yin. And the job of the Chinese doctor is to analyze you, so to speak, to ensure that the balance between the two phenomena is optimal, which means that you're here instead of over here in the authoritarian zone of the world or over here in the chaotic zone of the world. So, okay. Okay, so next week we start talking about this, the final part of the story, which is this, which is, I'm interested, you see, because we know we know that you have a very good reason for protecting your culture, which is that it regulates your emotions. Okay. What I'm interested in is, given that it's necessary for you to maintain your culture, even in the face of threats from other cultures, are there patterns of personal behavior that amplify its are there patterns of personal behavior that amplify the danger of culture and patterns of behavior that reduce it? So is there something about your relationship to your culture that can either exacerbate the intrinsic problems of group identification or reduce them? And that's what we're going to try to find out in the last part of the course. It's like, culture is necessary. The problem with the necessity of culture is that it, it, it virtually ensures the existence of conflict. Given that, is there a way to act to make it worse or to make it better? And that's what we're going to talk about here.